Good morning, everyone. Isn't it a wonderful day to be able to worship the Lord? Isn't it a wonderful day to be able to worship the Lord? Amen. Yes, that's right. Get me in the right mood. I've made enough mistakes this morning. I came along and I took my little USB up the back. And I'm going to load up all the PowerPoints. I didn't copy them across off the computer, did I? So, today I'm talking to you about Jotham and his son Ahaz. And if you want some scripture references, Jotham is 2 Kings 15 and 2 Chronicles 27. Ahaz is 2 Kings 16, 2 Chronicles 28, and Isaiah 7. Now you've got all that down now, haven't you? <laughs> so we'll start with 2 Kings chapter 15, verses 32 to 38. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. However, the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham, are they not, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? In those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, against Judah. So Jotham rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. Then Ahaz, his son, reigned in his place. There's something they've discovered in Jerusalem quite recently, uh, an ancient tomb in which there were 98 bodies or skeletons the remains of 98 people. And they've worked out that it was a wealthy family and it contained something like 23 or 24 generations of people. So when they say that they rested with his fathers, they're talking about somebody being buried in a, a family tomb. And you'll see the relevance of that when they say Jotham rested with his fathers Ahaz they buried in Jerusalem, but not with his fathers. They didn't like him, so he didn't get buried in the family tomb. Actually, Jotham was called king for 20 years, but for four of those years, he was co-regent with his father. That was a, quite a common practice as well. You learnt the trade under dad. So they would have the, the crown prince, or if you like, Charlie would be co-regent with uh, Queen Elizabeth for X number of years so that he knew what the job was. The same, they've been doing that for hundreds of years. His official reign was 16 years. He was one of the better kings of Judah. He built the upper gate of the house. He sponsored other construction projects throughout the land. And just before his death, Rezin from Syria and Pekah from Israel, they asked him to join them in an assault on Assyria. And he said, no, I don't want to do that. So they came down to have a go at him. And... Uh, Anyway, it didn't quite work. They did, however, 
conquer some of the armies of Israel, of Judah rather, and they took away about 200,000 prisoners. And we'll get to that in a moment. We've also been talking about some prophets that uh, were in action during the reign of these kings. One of them was Micah, and he began his ministry during the reign of Jotham. And of course Isaiah was there because Isaiah was uh, prophesying when Uzziah, Jotham's father, was there. In fact, Isaiah, according to Jewish tradition, was of the nobility. They believed he was of royal blood and that he was a first cousin to uh, King Uzziah. Now, that has an effect in the way they prophesied because Isaiah and Micah were contemporaries. Isaiah preached at the upper crust. Micah preached in the country. He was a country boy. But they're bringing the same message. And in fact, if you read the book of Micah, you, and you've got a Bible that gives you cross-referencing, you will find there is one passage in Micah that is exactly word perfect the same as the message in Isaiah. And there are quite a number of other references between Micah and Isaiah where while the words aren't the same, the thrust of the message is the same. They were contemporaries. Second Chronicles 27 verse 6 has an editorial comment. So Jotham became mighty because he prepared his way before the Lord his God. That was in stark contrast to the kings of Israel who ordered their ways after Jeroboam. Now the uh, historian Flavius Josephus has quite a lengthy comment on King Jotham. This is an extract from it. Now Jotham, the son of Uzziah, reigned over the tribe of Judah in Jerusalem, being a citizen thereof by his mother, whose name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok, the high priest. So we've got father-in-law is influencing the king to walk in the ways of the Lord. The king was not defective in any virtue, but was religious toward God, righteous toward men, and careful of the good of the city. And he then goes on to talk about uh, his building, rebuilding, and adornment of the temple and the walls and all the other things that Jotham did. And it says he also took great care of anything else in the kingdom that had been neglected. Josephus also mentions an expedition against the Ammonites, overcoming them and exacting tribute of a hundred talents and 10,000 cori of wheat and barley each year. And he finishes off his uh, dialogue on, uh, or his, yeah, on Jotham, and his own people lived happily. So he was a good king. He walked in the ways of the Lord and he looked after his people. Well, little is said of Jotham in the scripture, but a lot can be inferred from what little there is. And if we look at Jotham as a leader, using a set of uh, criteria developed by John Maxwell, in human economy, it's the pursuit of power and prestige. In God's economy, it's the pursuit of love and service to others.
Secondly, in human economy, the thrust is to improve wealth and the status of the leader. In God's economy, it's to improve the welfare of the people. In human economy, you see others as competitors. They're enemies in that sense. But in God's economy, you see others as brothers who can complement whatever it is that you're trying to do. Fourthly, the motive in human economy is to remove or kill opposition. And I mean, even in a business sense, you can talk about killing your opposition. You're not talking about actually taking their life. You're talking about it in a business sense. But in God's economy, the motive is to meet needs and to grow the cause. And fifthly, the result in human economy is that the leader is glorified. I won't make any political comments. I'll leave those for Gordon. <laughs> but in God's economy, it's the Lord who is glorified. Now, you can see from that, it would be nice if we had it up there, but that's my fault. The vast difference there is between human thinking or the human economy and the way people go after power, prestige, wealth. Oh, glory to me. Where a person who seeks the Lord and follows God's economy, it's what can I do for others so that the Lord can be glorified. And if there is any wealth, funnel it back into, into the Lord's work. And it is a fact, uh, as certain, no doubt you've all heard about some of the multi-millionaires in the United States back in the 30s and 40s in particular, who started off tithing when they were earning very little, finished up as multi-millionaires, tithing one was tithing 95% of his personal income and still couldn't spend the rest. God prospered their business because they channeled their money back into the kingdom. There's a blessing to be had in tithing. It's got nothing to do with the law. Jacob tithes 400 years before the law. Abraham tithed 500 years before the law. So it's got nothing, it's not legalistic. And as Michael Yusuf said this morning, if it was 10% under the law, should it be less under grace? Anyway, that's enough of that. We can see there that Jotham's motive was to give glory to the Lord and not accrue accolades to himself. You see, leaders are to be examples, not exceptions. As people see what the leader does, so they will do also. So particularly when you're looking through the scripture, if the king was good, the people tended to be good. They followed the king. If the king was off track, the people were off track. And that's why prophets came, to put them back on track. Isaiah, whose name means Yahweh is salvation, introduces himself as the son of Amoz. Now that's not to be confused with the prophet Amos. It's Amoz, A-M-O-Z. And according to Jewish tradition, as I said before, he was royal blood and a cousin of King Uzziah. He prophesied during the reign of several kings. He started to prophesy during the reign of Isaiah. Of course, he was there when Jotham was there. He had a fair bit to do with Ahaz. He had a lot to do with Hezekiah. 
And then Hezekiah's son Manasseh didn't like what Isaiah had to say and according to tradition had him stuffed up a hollow log and sawn in two. And there's a reference in Hebrews 11.37 about some being sawn in two and perhaps that refers to Isaiah, who knows. He was married and he had two sons. His eldest son was called Shia Jashub and that literally means a remnant will return. His second son had the lovely name of Maha Shalal Hashbaz. I've been practicing that. <laughs> Which means hasten the booty, speed the spoil. That son was born when Assyria was uh, prophesied to be called down by the Lord to chastise Judah because of their misbehaviour. And so the names of his sons were actually prophetic statements. I don't know whether they called him Bazar or not, but I can't imagine they would have called him by his full name all the time. Now Isaiah was preceded in the northern kingdom by Amos and Hosea. But in the southern kingdom, he and Micah were contemporaries. No book of the Old Testament, other than perhaps Psalms, speaks more powerfully to the modern day church. Redemption and salvation are major themes throughout the book of Isaiah, as is the fact that restoration follows judgment. And if you want to read Isaiah 65 and 66 in particular, you're reading, a, uh, almost reading, Revelation 21 and 22. They cover the same things, the new earth and the new heaven. Language might be a bit different, but that's what he's talking about. He's known as the Messianic prophet, but much of his writing was in fact evangelistic. Micah, he identifies himself as Micah of Morasheth and shouldn't be confused with Micaiah, Ben Imlah, the northern prophet who we met dealing with Ahab and Josephat. Though different in spelling, both names mean the same thing, who is like Yahweh. Jeremiah 26 verse 17 tells us that uh, Micah influenced Hezekiah for good and of course they had a similar message. Micah was at pains to point out that the saving grace of God cannot be earned. And one of my favourite verses, if you have favourite verses in the scripture, although I've heard it said my favourite verse is the last one I read, but... <laughs> In Micah 6, verses 6 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. And then verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. In verse 7, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? That's actually having a shot at Ahaz who reintroduced the worship of Molech, one of the Canaanite gods. And in the worship of Molech, they sacrificed their children 
for the cleansing of their soul. And Ahaz had put his firstborn son through the arms of Moloch, who was a bronze statue, and they lit a fire under it, and then they laid the children on the red-hot arms of Moloch. Sometimes they killed the child first. Most times the child was alive when it was laid on these. I mean, it's barbaric, I know. But they did these things. And so when Micah says, Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He's actually using what they were doing and saying, Should you do that? No, no, the Lord has shown you what he desires. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. All your sacrifices and all the other things mean nothing if the heart isn't in it. Now both of those prophets were pretty fiery when it was required. They served the Lord without fear or favour. Now in 2 Kings 16, we read there about Ahaz, verses 1 to 5. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. When they talk about father, they're talking about the family line from a prominent person. You could call Abraham your father, even if you lived 2,000 years after him, if you were in that family line. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, Indeed, he made his son pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills and under every green tree. Then Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to make war, and they besieged Ahaz but could not overcome him. Now the name Ahaz means he has grasped. It's an abbreviated form of the name Jehoahaz. He was the son of Jotham. He reigned from 732 to 715 BC. And it's thought that his name was shortened from Jehoahaz just to Ahaz because he was so unpopular. They didn't want to call him by his full name. Anyway, early in his reign, as I said earlier, uh, the other pair tried to join him in an anti-Assyrian alliance. They failed in that. Uh, Judah was defeated, even though Ahaz wasn't in that sense. They took about 200,000 uh, prisoners. And there's the intervention of another prophet who's only mentioned once in the scripture, and that's Oded, O-D-E-D. He secured the repatriation of the prisoners by pointing out that are you not all the children of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? Why then do you put your brothers into slavery? So they sent the prisoners home, sent them back again. Isaiah tried desperately to get Ahaz to put his trust in the Lord at the height of this crisis with Syria and Rezin and what have you. But the faithless king preferred to appeal to Assyria for help. Now, the king of Israel and the king of Syria are trying to get Ahaz to join them in an anti-Assyrian um, allegiance. But no, Ahaz says, no, not on your life. But then he calls on Assyria to help him. Okay, so what's the result of that? Yes, Assyria did help. As a result of which, Judah became a vassal of the Assyrian Empire for almost a century. 
and they were paying tribute for that time. It drained Judah's financial resources and caused them a lot of problems. In Isaiah 7, from verse 1, Isaiah is sent to King Ahaz. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved by the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now and meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted. For these two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah, because Assyria, Ephraim and the son of Remaliah have plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its walls for ourselves, and set a king over them, the son of Tobiel. So they were going to get rid of Ahaz and set up their own puppet king. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years Ephraim will be broken so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. That's a pretty solid sort of a statement. In other words, put your faith in the Lord your God because within another 65 years, Israel won't even exist. And that's true. Assyria took them away. They also conquered Syria. And so the two smoking stubs were gone. But Judah was still there. Although by now, of course, it was a vassal state to Assyria. And then in 710, Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, As a sign for yourself from the Lord your God, ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. He's a faithless and morally weak king. And in mock humility and piety, he wouldn't even seek a word from the Lord, being more attached to his pagan ways. So Isaiah continues, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house, days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. Well, while all this mess is going on, the Philistines and the Edomites said, whoops, they're in a mess. We'll make a grab. And so they both attacked. And in 2 Chronicles 28, for again the Edomites had come, attacked Judah and carried away captives. The Philistines had also invaded the cities of the lowland and the south of Judah and had taken Beth Shemesh, Aegelon, Gedaroth, Soka and its villages, Timnah with its villages, 
Gimzo with his villages, and they dwelt there. For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel, for he had encouraged moral decline in Judah and had been continually unfaithful to the Lord. Well, as we saw, he burnt his son as an offering to Moloch, a pagan god of the Ammonites. And I told you how that worked. And of course, human sacrifice is an abomination to the Lord. He encouraged corrupt worship. He placed an Assyrian-type altar in the temple court. Uriah the priest built the altar um, in deference to Ahaz. Instead of, fearless, you know, instead of fearlessly rebuking him and saying, this is the Lord's temple. No, no, he built the altar that Ahaz wanted and it was built on the design of the altar in the temple of the king of Assyria. He used the displaced Solomon bronze altar for divination. Now divination is also an abomination to the Lord. And he closed the temple sanctuary. I mean, this guy's really gone off track, hasn't he? Ahaz established idolatry so strongly in Judah that not even good Hezekiah, his son, would be able to root it out. He was the most wicked king known in Judah up to that time, and he reigned for 16 years. And in 2 Chronicles 28, verse 27, So Ahaz rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the city, in Jerusalem, but they did not bring him into the tombs of the kings of Israel, and Hezekiah his son reigned in his place. As a leader, Ahaz was a total failure. He undid all the good done by Jehoshaphat, which was maintained by Jotham and Uzziah and he left an unholy mess for Hezekiah to try and clean up. Remember what I said earlier, leaders are examples, not exceptions. As the people see what the leader does, so the people will do also. And those who are leading God's people, I mean you can apply this to business as well, those who are leading God's people must never enter into arrangements with those who've abandoned the fundamentals of the faith. No matter how statesmanlike or logical such a move may appear to be. Remember, the Lord says no compromise. He doesn't compromise. He doesn't expect us to compromise our faith and our standing in him. Deuteronomy 17 verses 14 to 20 set out the Lord's requirements for kings as it was given to Moses. And we'll go through them, Jotham and Ahaz. Has to be from among the brethren, of, of, from the tribe of Judah. Yes, they were both from the tribe of Judah. Not multiply horses, in other words, not rely on your own strength. Judah relied on, uh, Jotham relied on the Lord, Ahaz didn't. They were not to have multiple wives, polygamy, well we don't know. We know that uh, Jotham had one wife and uh, Ahaz obviously had a son, Hezekiah, who became king, but how many wives he had is never mentioned, so we just leave that one question mark. Copy the law, especially Deuteronomy, for himself. The king was to write out the law for himself. Jotham did, Ahaz didn't. Fear the Lord. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Jotham, yes. Ahaz, no. Trust in the Lord, not other kingdoms, especially not Egypt. Jotham, yes. Ahaz, no. So we get to the compliance score. Jotham's got five out of six. Ahaz has one out of six. 
So he didn't fit the, the mould of kings as it was set out in Deuteronomy at all. Well, the worship of God was corrupted by false values and practices. Has the worship of God today been corrupted by false values and practices? And is there a remedy? Well, we'll move into some contemporary stuff for a few minutes. If you like, you could call it signs of the times. Rugby player Israel Folau was reviled and had his career destroyed because he posted on social media what the Bible says about homosexuality. Now, every time you read about that in the paper still, they claim it's Israel Folau's homophobic statement. It's not. It's God's statement. Now we've got seven manly Sea Eagles players who stood aside on principles of faith against wearing the rainbow pride jersey, which is allegedly inclusive of all those letters, L B L G B T I, whatever. But Isaiah 5, 20 to 21 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 21 follows up, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Now the LGBTI is a small group in the total population, but they are very vocal and they are pandered to by various governments. They have a very pervasive influence. In 1 Corinthians 5, 6 and 7, says, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. See, leaven is used in cooking, as we probably all know, and it has a fermenting effect. It pervades the whole lump and it causes whatever it might be, bread or whatever, to rise. It pervades the whole lump and leaven is often used in scripture as an example of the pervasive influence of sin. Sin will pervade. It's like leaven. It works its way in and gradually works through the whole lump. Romans 1 verse 32, this follows all those things about, you know, where they, they knew God because they've got the stars, they've got the heavens, they've got the creation, but they chose to go the other way and then it nominates a whole list of things that they've done wrong and finishes up in verse 32. Who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who do them. So it's not just a matter of whether or not you're involved in LG whatever movement. It's those who approve of it. So what do we say to those in leadership at Manly, what are they approving of? That their seven players of Christian faith said, we're not going to wear that jersey. Now that's a pretty fair stand because they could have their contract cancelled. They could finish up like Israel for hour. But they're prepared to do that. Of course, the papers like to say, oh, it's their culture. Well, yeah, it is their culture because the, the islands are probably more Christian than what this country is now. Genesis 6 tells us that God's spirit will not always strive with man, 
because in 6.5, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 19 tells us of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, the obvious thing there is the homosexuality and bestiality and uh, idol worship and so on. But it's Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50 that give us the underlying cause of that. This was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness, neither did they strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me, therefore I took them away as I saw fit. The abomination was the result of living in a very, very prosperous area. Because they lived in a prosperous area, or country if you want to call it that, they had pride. Look at us. So they had that. They had plenty, plenty of food. They didn't have to work more than 30 hours a week. So they have an abundance of idleness. So what are we going to do with ourselves when we've got time in our hands? Oh, let's try this, let's try that, let's try something else. If you're busy, you don't have time to try all these strange things. Oh, what about the poor and needy? Don't worry about them, we're okay. I'm all right, Jack. Now, some people might say, well, they, were, they too were in the days of Noah. Yet God would have spared them if ten righteous people had been found there. Now, that was the result of intercession by Abraham. We read about that in Genesis 18. And we can learn valuable principles of prayer there from his intercession. You see, it's not the presence of evil that brings God's mercy and suffering to an end. It's the absence of good. If there had been ten good people in Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord would not have destroyed the cities. But there was an absence of good. There was only a lot and his wife and his two daughters. And you might say, well, we're not so sure about them either. You see, we can intercede on behalf of our nation. Our intercession must be in line with God's character. And we may appeal to the Lord to preserve his name, his honour and his perfect justice before the world. Remember that man talks about influence in terms of numbers. We have so many for, so many against and, you know, something passes because so many voted for it and only a few against. And I'm nearly finished, Jim. But God's arithmetic is different. He would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of ten righteous people. God saves by many or by few. Jesus told us that one of the signs of his coming would be as it was in the days of Noah. And in Matthew 24, 44, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So I leave you with these thoughts. Are you praying? Are you interceding for the nation? Are you ready? if the Lord returns? And are you watching in anticipation of the Lord's return? And at that I'll say, Amen.